Welcome to the CoinGecko Podcast. I'm your host, Bobby Young. Each week, we will be interviewing someone from the blockchain industry to learn more about this fast-moving cryptocurrency economy. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for coming. The CoinGecko Podcast is produced each week to help you stay ahead of the curve. Show notes can be found at podcast.coingecko.com. I highly encourage you to join our newsletter where we send out top news in the crypto industry every Monday to Friday. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter and Telegram at CoinGecko. Welcome to the CoinGecko podcast. For today's episode, we'd love to welcome Chris Zagnun, the CEO of DAOMaker. So DAOMaker is a cryptocurrency-focused tech and strategy consultancy. The firm's technology products have been used by projects like NAM, AVA, and Elrond to create pluggable community hubs, white labor DAOs, dynamic token distribution curves, and more. Welcome to the show, Chris. Hey, thanks. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I guess for start, maybe Chris, like, do you want to give a, a short introduction of what you do at Ground and what do you do at DAOMaker? So DAOMaker is basically uh, one of the few strategic consultancies in crypto, to, which helps small coins, large coins move around the industry. I usually tell people who are not in crypto, we're like the tour guide through the Wild West. And we tell them, okay, this is a scammer. This is, you know, don't have to pay for this exchange. Strategic consulting, how to get on Coinbase, how to get on Binance, how to plug into Uniswap, et cetera, right? There's, the industry is moving extremely fast and we have people up to date all the time. And that's why people come to us. So I think something's interesting about Dowmaker, I think I uh, read up recently, is that you guys have this new form of ICO called Daiko, which is this dynamic coin offering. Maybe tell us a little bit about what Daiko is and some of the projects that have used this structure. Sure. So the Daiko is the brainchild of How to and Me, my partner. And since 2017, I was obsessed with the idea of the ICO and crowdfunding. However, obviously that failed. Equity crowdfunding equally fails, considering that there's only been four or five positive exits from every single equity crowdfunding platform. So we knew that there's a good idea here, which is giving decentralizing VC funding. But the execution has always been horrible. And the ICO is also horrible execution because the only reason why you would invest in an ICO is the day one flip. Not because of any other reason, but because it's designed this way. Because the asset is hyper liquid. Meaning I can buy it today, I can buy it in one month. And unless the value is fundamentally very undervalued on day one, it will most likely be lower at a lower price one month later. So there's no opportunity cost into buying it one month later. However, if I buy the coin one month later, the company doesn't get my money, right? Some other exchange and some trader gets my money. So if I'm here and I want to buy this company for the long term, then I'm the right target market, but I would never give my money to the company itself. And that is the fundamental issue with ICO. So Daiko is trying to solve this problem and build a protocol, a framework that can be sustainable. Now we have a lot of IEOs and so on, but these things do not sustain. At the moment, we have a hype, right? So everybody invests. But once this hype is over, the whole thing will collapse again. The DAIC was designed to be a system that can work long-term, no matter the market conditions. I know that there was a project that launched recently, Orion Protocol, that uses the DICO framework. And based on what I'm reading, is basically some sort of like a refundable mechanism where you, if the token price is below the ICO price, after nine months, 12 months, 16 months, you get to basically refund 80% of your investment in the ICO. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, so there's a, core, a few core aspects which make a DICO not a refundable token sale. So every DICO is a refundable token sale, but not every refundable token sale is a DICO. So what makes these two different is in a DICO, every single token that is sold is backed by real money. A refundable token sale is not a money-backed token sale. A DICO is essentially if you take DAI and you mix it with an ICO. So in theory, DAI should be stable, and it is. In theory, a DICO should be stable at 0.8% or 80% of the original value. The reason is because every token, every single token that has been sold can be refunded at 80% of the value. So if the coin sells at $1, then each token can be refunded at 80 cents, which means if I'm a DICO investor and I have a whitelisted address and the price falls below the 80 cent mark, I can buy it from the off the market, wait some time, and make risk-free profits, just like you can make risk-free profits and die. And all these stable coins, how they work. So if it falls below 80 cents, 
then somebody else is giving away their real money back value to you so that you can make money on the way down. In the refundable token sale, you cannot make money as DOPS. That's one of the core differences. Then basically what happens is during it in the DICO sale, like 80% of the funds raised are locked in a Gemini custody and held in USD. Yes. And the teams couldn't have access to this thing until after nine months, in which case another 20% yes. get locked. I guess unlock. Yes. Yes. After right. twelve months, another thirty percent, and then after sixteen months, their four hundred percent is unlocked. So, so I guess my question is, what happens after sixteen months? Then, like the team got all the money, they can do whatever they want, and then then the price can go down. So let's say it this way: the DAIC was designed to be the solution between equity, which is I call equity accountability, and liquidity. Liquidity is tokens. Equity is extremely illiquid. Tokens are extremely unaccountable. You take these two together. You have something better than what both of them were individually. The reason a DAIC was accountable but a refundable token sale is not is because every single token that gets refunded in a DAIC will be buried. So, for example, Algorand and a few other companies, Solana had refundable token sales, but these tokens do not get burnt. They get back to the company, which means the money is in a different format, but it's still available. So, even if the company fails, they don't lose anything. In a DICO, 100% of the sold supply, if people are not satisfied, after 60 months, gets burned. Now, there's a saying, a famous saying, is like you can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Which means you can maybe pump up a coin for three months and keep the price stable by doing marketing and hoax and bullshit, which we see a lot in crypto. But you cannot do that for 12 or 60 months. You cannot fool all your investors for 60 months because they will see that you're not doing anything. You're just pretending to do something. So yes, you could potentially work for 60 months and actually do a real product and then stop working after 60 months. But most people won't do that because people who have the intention of scamming will not even go with the DICO because it's just too much work to actually have to work for 60 months to scam after 60 months. It's just not economic for them. And I know for the DICO only... ICO participants get to buy, sell the tokens back to the team at 80% of the value. Why do you make it that way instead of opening up to anybody who purchases the secondary market? Yes. So we designed the DAIC again in a system, in a market, let's say February, March market. No funding happened at all, completely dry. So the first problem that you have to fix in order to make crowdfunding work is that people actually give the money to the company and not the money to the exchange, right? There's an insane market where people like to buy tokens, new tokens, small caps on the market. However, the primary market is dead. So first of all, what we had to do is we had to transfer some of that funding from the secondary market back to the primary market. Otherwise, the companies don't have any money. So if you invest in an ICO right now, you have the most risk because there's no price discovery. You could wait for the price discovery on the secondary market can watch the company for two months work, evaluate it, so you have much less risk, and you actually have a better deal because the company is now two months older and probably even have a lower price. If you buy it at the ICO, you're the one who found, who's giving the company the money. You're the founding members. You have more risk, no benefits whatsoever, but you're the one who gives the company the money. Without you, they couldn't even start. So the DICO changes this by giving the people who are giving the, money, the company money special benefits, benefits that nobody else will ever have because we're, you're the ones which enabled this company to even exist, such as the refundable sale, meaning you can make money on the way down, such as your wallet address is whitelisted, improved staking rewards for the rest of your life, which means in a DICO, even the wallet that you use to contribute will have a value. It's, a, it's almost like an NFT that you can now trade and give away for the future because you're one of the few people who believed in the company and you took increased risk because of price discovery. Now, you may be biased, but do you think this DICO will be, become more popular? Like, I mean, so far we've only seen Orion launching such mechanisms. Yes. At the moment, we are back into 2017-like behavior when everybody can raise money. It's also important to note that Binance, as of right now, raised, is making a raise of $3 million for Sandbox. So that's the highest average, $3 million. The Orion sale with the DICO raised around 3.5, which means if you are a serious company, you can still raise now more 
than buying it itself, you can easily raise 500, 600, maybe a million dollars without a DICO. However, you're a serious company, unless the market does not even increase even more than it is right now, which is quite crazy at the moment, you have better odds of raising more money with DICO than no DICO. Oh. And once the market goes back to normal or back to dead, then I think we will see a lot more people adopting the DICO model. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts, right? Now let's talk a bit about the ICO market in general. So the boom, the peak of the ICO market was late 2017, early 2018, where it was common for people to raise. $20 million raise was kind of like the norm, like average amount, and then like some raised up to a billion dollars, a few billion dollars. And then 2019 came by and then everybody was struggling to do ICO. How much is the average amount raised in ICO these days? You mean, what's the time frame? Because this switch is so okay, fast. Let's, let's say like, What's the average amount that is raised last year, 2019, and what's the amount raised at the start of 2020, and then maybe more recent data in the past couple? Okay. So, 2019, especially like the last quarter, was was very bad for funding. Right. We saw almost no funding. All the IEOs stopped funding itself. We have a lot of connections to Howby and so on, and even Binance, and they just didn't want to raise any. At that point in time, we were running two key campaign and had also marginal success with raising. That was probably one of the reasons why we started working on the DICO model, because we know that once the hype is gone, people still need funding. I think at that point we had like, we saw around three, four million dollars of total token sale funding in, it was in October. I remember that specifically, which was, I think, 98% less than a year before. So we really saw a, this whole industry dying off completely. Even the, the camera industry didn't fall by 99%. So what we are seeing right now with the DeFi hype is, is probably going to be short-lived. Right? That's why every, all the scams come out, push out their exchange, their sales, and so on. I don't know how much two key raised, but I guess it was around three to four million dollars for the average amount that can, can be raised these days. Well, it was about there was this amount over three years. Okay. And what do you think about IEOs? Do you think that's a reasonable way for? projects to raise money in this space or that's sort of like a marketing gimmick by exchanges. I mean, it's sort of dead as well. Like, I mean, but it's coming back in 2020. It's coming back now and it will go away right away because it's not a funding model at all. Because in order to sustain this model, you need to allocate funds for pumping the price. That's just how it is. It sounds a bit weird, but that's how it is. There's an escrow service, not the same for all IELTS, but for many of them. And your money is an escrow unless you get a two free X which means you need to use the money that you just raised in order to pump your coin. And if you don't, then you don't even get the money that was raised in the first place. So in order to raise the money, you need to spend 80% of the money. In our model, it's similar, but in order to raise the money, you just have to keep that money in escrow. And if you're successful, you get the money continuously. So it's a similar model, but more sustainable for long term. Cool. Um, so also, Hatu, uh, the CMO of DAO Maker, just joined the call as well. So it's probably a good time to introduce Hatu over here. So uh, thanks for introducing. The main thing I want to say, a uh, thing like Chris said, is we've been in crypto for a while and we've seen a lot of funding methods come in. We've had, um, first was you know the hype run of 2017 and we started moving towards IEOs, but it was kind of the same of the old. You'd have a quick, uptake in price initially and everyone would be interested but they would kind of drop it off right away i'm not sure if chris had the opportunity to show this model where we kind of discuss how we have this natural cup and handle chart in the space where initially projects come out they don't have a lot of adoption and the price kind of kicks off so people immediately like pull back because of the hyper liquidity in the market liquidity is one of the main draw drawing aspects that brings people to crypto but it's also interesting in the point where it kind of throws off everyone when the price uh, is not performing well. And it's the, the lack of performance that kind of begets lack of interest at the same time. So it, we kind of enter this kind of death spiral with a lot of coins where they raise a lot of money, but as soon as the price kicked off, people lost interest in the product itself. So the main idea with the DICO was not just that the money should be safe. It was also to make sure that the projects, especially if they have a longer time horizon, have this ability to keep people coming back because they need to see the milestones the project is keeping up with. So there's obviously a price floor there, but as long as the community keeps coming back to see whether or not they should validate or invalidate the funds the project has, 
they have a reason to come checking up what's happening. So this gets the interest in the product. And the, we gave a 16 month horizon for our, the first cycle of Orion, which we felt was a good timeline for them to develop a kind of product they are, you know, a bridge between DeFi and CFI. It's, it's an ambitious project. It's been in development since 2018, but we felt still 16 months is enough. People to realize, okay, the product's gonna come out and do I still want to hold on to token? I think it's a big move in the entire concept of VC because the traditional idea has always been, you cannot enter a VC uh, decision while still you know, limiting your downside. In this case, you can stay vested for up to 16 months and you could still then decide in the end, okay, I've seen the products, I've seen the roadmap delivery rate, I've seen the adoption, and now I wanna decide whether I'm gonna stay in. So it, the main point with this was to make it exciting again because it had largely died down. And we saw that a lot of people were excited with the fact that they could actually stay invested and hold on to it and then see how it does after 16 months. It didn't just actually sell out. The good part was that a lot of, there was a huge supply side shortage you know, on exchange order books, which kind of showed that people were falling into the proposal we had made to them, which was hold on to it and see how it does in around 16 months. That's good. You know, we now have larger portion of people with a long-term mindset. They are willing to see actually how the products are. This, it's a model that's kind of befitting the new concept. Now, of course, we have this kind of DeFi hype phase. Which there's a lot of Uniswap pumps and dumps. And as Chris said, it's likely not going to last very long. Because as soon as people start losing substantial amounts of money collectively, it kind of goes away. Let's talk about the other product that you have, uh, Social Mining. It seems to me that it's sort of like an incentivized platform, sort of like users get token airdrops for doing particular tasks, like making a video, writing a review of the project. Uh, did I describe it correctly? So social mining is essentially a platform which me and my co-founder, CTO, designed, started designing mid-2018, once all the funding died off, in order to, again, make people more bonded to, the, to these coins, right? As to just mentioned, hyper-liquidity is our biggest friend and enemy in this industry. Because yes, okay, I like it when it pumps, but I don't like when it dumps. So the whole concept of social mining is to make people more engaged. If I know, if I understand the project better, if I understand what they do, if I have more reasons to be a part of this community, then I'm not going to sell. And projects like this too, because if people don't sell, then the market cap will be higher. Then there's more marketing, there's more PR coverage, et cetera, et cetera. If there's more activity. The social mining started off as the idea of how can we make people more bonded to these coins and stop making them jump from coin A to coin B to coin C because this is a never ending cycle. So we had to be like, guys, stick with one coin for like a year and choose the ones which actually do something positive because you're enabling the scammers. As long as you keep jumping from one scam to the next, there will be another scam and another scam. And that's the, how I, social mining started. So you guys are deeply involved in the crypto space and you spot trends in the market cycles pretty early. Just want to get your thoughts. Where do you think the market is heading in the second half of 2020 and how do you think 2021 will come out, will shape up? Well, I'm pretty certain that we're going to see one major change. So, you know, in Q3, we have this huge excitement for early Uniswap listings where volume picks up. But... Yeah, you can only milk this concept so many times where the whole concept is that we're getting these huge APRs on, you know, deposit a token with some ETH and you're going to get some tokens back. It's like a 2017 master nods. I don't know if you, you were looking at those. Basically, you would buy this huge bag of tokens and then the token would have no use case besides the fact that it gives you more tokens. And people quickly realized, wait, I'm just accumulating something that's worthless. And the whole point was the next guy hopefully will buy the more tokens that I got. So there's kind of a capacity that we saw this very quickly with the Wi-Fi forks. They had this huge peak and then immediate collapse because they realized, okay, so the token only has a usage based on other people wanting to buy it. And it's actually the same with a lot of the Uniswap LP programs, which are kind of based on deposit your tokens and we're going to give you more. We're going to triple your token back in, in by the end of the year, which it's not going to even reach a year because people, you know, just want to sell it to someone else. Wi-Fi, of course, kind of made, squeezed in everything in a week and it's forks made the mistake of often doing that too. People wanted immediate returns. 
uh, supply inflation was too fast. Uniswap is a bit slowed down version of that because supply inflation is much slower. 300% APR over the course of a year versus you know doing that over the course of a week is very different. But the model is going to be the same. It's just the concept of mass or not applied to whole new coins. Of course, the original Wi-Fi was different because they had an underlying technology. It has a good earning potential protocol itself, which is something else. But a lot of these Uniswap LP programs that a lot of new coins are shooting out entirely for focus on the same concept. We're going to give you a lot of tokens as long as you stay rested in. It builds into a game of chicken where the first guy, as long as everyone holds in, we're good. We're good, you know. But then eventually there's going to be this first guy who starts selling it. And then, you know, you just enter the spiral towards the bottom. So this is going to end clearly. But crypto funding itself is not. We actually did a research paper a while ago, which is what drove us to make a DICO, which was focused on there's three kinds of crowdfunding. You have product crowdfunding in which uh, the person who buys into the product, you know, a Kickstarter, takes all the risk, but has no upside. A good example is Oculus. You know, the funding was provided to Oculus. It had a large multi-billion dollar exit with the people who took all the risk. They never got anything out of it except the product which is a very odd system. So then that led up to equity crowdfunding. But the issue with equity crowdfunding was that there was never an opportunity for exit or almost never. I think out of hundreds of equity crowdfunding projects, only a handful, you can count them on one hand, have listed and they've almost always had a negative listing. And then came the token sales. Now, I found it kind of sad that over the course of the first quarter and then quickly again, you know, as third and fourth quarter which came in 2019, token sales kind of died off. And it became apparent that the IEO craze wouldn't come back. But I was certain that token sales are not going to go away. It needed a new framework where people feel a bit more confident because the main issue is pe people's lack of confidence. So the token concept was already great. It just needed a new framework where people have lower risk associated with the typical problems with you know, token sales, uh, lack of credibility, no rights over the money and factors which make it a non-security. So there's a thing we have an internal team, which is the very fact that, you know, makes tokens viable, that you do not have to register them to the security and go through all the process also makes them a pain. And if ever a team tries to associate those things to a token, then they get labeled a security and they can't do it. So this was kind of a good sweet ground where as long as the fund stays escrow and we can utilize a social mining system to do a governance, whether or not the funds should be released or not on the deadlines where the, where the project is given. Like for the first like I was 9, 12, and 16 month for performance. You basically are able to comply with the aspect that your, like token holders can decide and validate the team's performance without turning into security. So I think more models like these are going to pop up more. And I don't know if you've been keeping up recently, but the concept of governance is becoming stronger and stronger. We've been working on it for since 2018 almost, but it's playing a bigger role into it because like, like I said, as funds again draw, dry up, more and more teams are going to be like, okay, we would, we would like to give the token the power of governance. It doesn't turn into security, but it allows you know, the community to monitor the funds, ensure its release mechanisms, and other factors like you know, even inflation. And now back to social mining is we're kind of pulling all of these factors into that software. It's a very battle-tested technology. It's already used by several top 100 coins, in fact, several top 50 coins now. And its main purpose is that the community itself, as long as they're token holders, get more say in the project. For the time being, we initially started with them governing each other and community matters. It moved up and now it's kind of focused towards the community managing the inflation rate of the token. And with the DICO, it's community managed inflation rate from staking and rewards. Plus, also we're seeing whether or not funds should be released. It has this elevated status for the community on a consistent basis. But of course, it's, it's been gradual depending on how much both the teams and the community are willing to, the teams, how much are they willing to give up in terms of responsibilities, how much the community is willing to take. We're seeing a consistent trend where the average participant is becoming more and more educated and they want more responsibility. And that in turn actually gives these tokens a huge new layer of value because initially the token did have value associated with the with social mining because it would give them governance rights, but it was limited. Now, as they manage to plug more value to the token, like release the funds, 
And on top of that, some of the staking releases, community has, you know, associates that likes the token. And it's a win-win situation where the community's tokens go up in value on the basis of them having strong governance over the ecosystem. And the teams get, you know, give more responsibility to the community. So they have less worries about whether or not the community will accept on certain decisions. What do you think about the, um, the yield farming fad that is going around? Like, I mean, people are talking about 10%, 20%, and 50%, 100% APL, and then now we have Wi-Fi and 1,000% APL. How long do you think this fad will last? Like, do you think this is something that will be, we'll see some form of another surviving for a long haul, or this is a short-term thing that will die off very quickly? Well, I would say that Wi-Fi was kind of a unique scenario because the underlying protocol actually generate, was generating a lot of money. That's not the case with the with the forks of Wi-Fi because they actually make money to the underlying protocol. So you have a situation where you have a single protocol that, that makes this format of rapid distribution in a week and well, or two weeks, and people get very excited and they all are going, but it's an important factor here that the underlying protocol was very successful and was making money. And now it's forks just make the underlying protocol for the first one money again. That's important. If you want to, it's important to recognize that Andre had a successful product. He could have sold the tokens directly and made a lot of money. Instead, he made it a community program and just gave out the tokens. That's what made Wi-Fi so valuable that the guy could have, instead of selling it, he just gave it off for free. Those tokens were, had value regardless of the APR system. Now, the rest of the copies are just master nodes in the sense that people are trying to accumulate these tokens on the entire basis of having someone else to sell it to. It's a, you know, greater fool's theory, but squeeze into one week. As for the rest of them, I've made a point on Compound several times that basically our Compound is giving away free subsidies without actually trying to grow the business. Essentially, it's the same of ride-sharing business where the VCs fund uh, you taking large subsidies on your ride, which is good, you know, if you want people to actually get involved. But that's not the case with what's happening with Compound. If people are taking the largest amount of borrowers on the platform, which is at the moment DAI, not going to be taken without those subsidies and something is completely wrong, which is the current, currently the case. The reason is that they didn't have a business focus with those lending. The reasoning I would say is they have a view of making DAI more valuable, which is not really business oriented mindset because the reality is we can see from all the exchange lending platforms CFI and even the larger ecosystems like Genesis Trading, their biggest demand for the bars is either for stable coins like Tether, which have high demand in exchanges because that's where the main volume pairs are, and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the primary one. Now, Compound have this unique opportunity where they're giving these huge incentives every week. I don't know, we're worth a million dollars. But they can actually get people interested into tokenizing and wrapping Bitcoin at rapid speed and then telling them deposit and get the subsidies for it. Now, the huge, the largest portion of the business in the, in the centralized market is often for borrowing Bitcoin. If Compound could pull over all that wrapped Bitcoin, it makes it easy for the traders. And now they actually have a substantial market for that asset that's heavy in demand. But they didn't do that. You know, they kind of separate the business purpose of this and they made it, how can you just get in more users? Which is the wrong approach. Now you just have people who are there to farm and they're going to leave as soon as it's done. The main point should have been, look, what are, what's the major portion of the lending market? It's often either USDC, USDT, or, or Bitcoin. That should have been the focus of this. Okay, we're going to use these massive subsidies at the rate of millions a week and use them to get people to use our product, almost in a sense, not even for free, but in a paid manner, so they get used to it. And that what they would otherwise be borrowing from, say, Celsius or BlockFi or even Genesis trading on large volumes, they do it on our platform. That should have been the goal, but instead it's completely, I don't know. That it doesn't have a purpose at the moment. Kind of. As for Balancer, which is the next one, I think it's, it's tough to say. What's ironic is that there's very little volume on Balancer. People are just using it to milk the airdrop, which is also deviating from the business goals. If the goal was to make the product a success, it shouldn't just be let people put money in, let them claim those airdrops and then leave. They are trying to combat that now. They did accept that they didn't have a smooth launch. They are improving this. But I would still say that I think they need to have a pinpointed business focus, which is, from my understanding, they want more volume as in 
that will drive the revenue for the protocol itself. They're not taking any asset deposit fees. In the long, long run, it will come from the trading fees. But Balancer has an unnoticeable factor in that. As for the rest of the space that's coming out with huge yields, I don't think I have seen anything that's viable at the moment, except maybe MTA. MTA, I'm not going to jump on that. It's very controversial. <laughs> it's basically the DeFi fans like Curve, and I use Curve quite frequently, so I do like that. And then you have MTA fans who are kind of like, okay, it's a VC back coin. It's going to explode. I was not a fan of that launch. It does have a high yield, but it's been drained out pretty fast instantly, basically because it's a strong arbitrage. But MTA is kind of what we should be moving away from. It's a project that did a seed sale at a 95% discount just days before it did a public sale. I mean, that's, that's worse than 2017 deals. I mean, in 2017, to have VCs go to projects and tell them they are from this family office and then teams would be like, wow, I want a family office associated with me because it gives me great business growth. And they would give them like an 80%, 70% deal, which would immediately after listing cause the token to collapse. I don't know if you remember those days where a token would list and at 1x and it would immediately go to 0.1x. It's because there were, there were enough people in the room who got it that substantial of discount. And now you have a token that's given a 95% discount to VCs. And then the team has the nerve to go like, okay, I want the community to kind of come in now. We just realize you're very important for us. That's the thing people should be stepping away from, uh, the teams especially. They realize they want a team, but they don't want to give the community the best deal. Andre is where he went the complete opposite way. You know, that's just why Wi-Fi took off so well. There was no such thing as a VC seed round or anything like this. It's just, okay, everything's for the community. And that kind of made the project so successful and popular instantly. It was so drastically different from the norm. All right. Very interesting explanation that you gave. I think we are sort of running out of time. So maybe before you wrap it up, like maybe briefly explain the next couple of minutes. What are DAO makers' plans for 2020 and beyond? So we've been quite successful raising other people's companies and incubating them. Now we actually have quite a portfolio of companies we've worked help with. Elrond, Orion, LTO some big names at this point. We are now moving forward to the next cycle and something called the hodler sale. The hodler sale is something that we tested with Orion where we allocate allocations, not like in Binance, on a system of two weeks holding, but on a meritocratic scale, which we developed for social mining. Social mining evaluates users based on 12 different indexes. We scan the block explorer, we look at the work, and then we say, okay, this is good developers, this is good designers, this is good holders, this is good biz developers, etc. And based on your indexes, you will now have access to further good sales that we do. With every single sale that we did, we have a we build up a reputation of you know making people money. And this gets into a feedback loop because we give allocations to people which we know are good community members, people we know do not sell, right? People we know that we don't flip, and this makes the whole ecosystem more valuable. So now it splits into DICOs, which is essentially these 80% sales and these smaller cap raises. So smaller project, there's a, a really good niche in this industry. You know, you can build a small protocol which has utility and use case with smart and you don't need much money, like two, $300,000 and maybe a bit more. These will go to the hotter sales than DICOs. And we're currently designing and building a whole new platform for this ecosystem for fundraising, for secure fundraising directly to community, because that's where we think the future is. And maybe Andre proved that very well by now having the second most, not valuable coin, but the coin at the second highest price, let's say it this way. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about community. Crypto is all about community, community, community. If you don't engage or get your community on board, then there's really no need for a crypto project, right? Yep. Well, it's a bit more, so we're not just taking on the funding part, right? So. We're kind of shifting the platform itself, social mining, and combining it with the DICOs to make a, a system in which you can, as soon as you have a proper launch off system, right? So you can get off with the token to, and then easily plug in the social mining platform, which now actually ties in as a, one of the Legos at the same to DeFi. In the sense that it recognizes all the LP tokens you're making. So traditional staking only focused on holding the native token. We've made it such that it recognizes liquidity providers 
we want to make sure the community actually takes a more active role in not just biz dev or tech development, but also in providing liquidity. So it starts recognizing all the pools that people are participating in and considers that as a stake in the network. And then it builds a kind of like a, a bell curve out of how everyone is participating to kind of move native staking away from just a passive income. And instead they're turning it into more of a reward for activity. So yes, there will still remain a reward as passive income for just holding into it, but people who have taken a more active role, where they turn into a biz dev aid for the project, uh, which we've seen with LTO, for example, social mining actually did manage to do that, or start growing major community uh, roads across the world, something common in the NEM ecosystem for social mining, or just you know want to provide liquidity, which is a valuable asset to the project as a whole. And it's, you know, instead of just reducing circulating supply, do more. That's the whole point. And it builds this curve where from the mean value, people who, who are completely passive, they fall at the bottom end of the bell curve and release a, a skew of less than the mean staking rewards. And whatever they receive less is kind of pulled into a bonus for the ones who are actively running the ecosystem. So it becomes like an autonomous system for distributing the staking rewards, yet it can be governed by the community within it itself. I think that's going to be more interesting because we haven't launched that phase in a full format and it's going to be a new format for basically giving community the right to hold more than just you know govern each other's activities right cool cool guys thanks a lot for taking the time to explain this thing i think it was interesting talking about daiko and some of the trends that you're seeing in the crypto space mm -hmm. thank you so much bobby i was happy to be thanks here. yeah it was great Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. All, All right, that wraps up the show. Thank you for listening to the CoinGecko podcast with Bobby. If you like our show and want to know more, check out podcast.coingecko.com or please leave us a review on iTunes. If you have any feedback, do drop us an email at hello at coingecko.com. Join us for more next week. See ya! This podcast is provided as part of the overall information on cryptocurrency contained on our website, is for your general information only, and does not howsoever constitute any endorsement, financial or investment advice, nor any solicitation or offer of securities or other financial instruments. CoinGecko and the podcast presenter makes no warranties, implied or express, of any kind in relation to this podcast, including, without limitation, the accuracy and updatedness of its content. All opinions and recommendations therein the podcast are based on the personal opinion of the presenter. Please conduct your own research and procure professional advice should you, at your own risk, decide to howsoever invest or trade in relation to the content contained in the podcast.